So I'm Jenny Wolgamuth, and I'm a faculty member in the Measurement and Research Program in USF's College of Education. And I'm also co-chair of the Qualitative Advisory Group, which is better known by us as the QUAG. So the QUAG is a college-led a university-wide group of faculty members who support the development of qualitative coursework and think collectively about the power of qualitative research methodologies. So this webinar is sponsored by the QUAG along with the David C. Anshin Center and the College of Education's Graduate Student Council. And I wanna give a particular thanks to Rachel from the Anshin Center for supporting all the logistics of this event. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Panos. I'm an assistant professor of literacy studies and affiliate faculty in measurement and research, um, and am co-chair with Jenny of the QUAG. Um, I also serve as program co-chair of the Qualitative Research Special Interest Group. Um, Jenny is an alumni <laughs> of that position, <laughs> um, which is part of the American Educational Research Association. And I'm ecstatic to be here to learn from Dr. Bea's um, work. So thank you all for coming. Yeah, we are. We're very glad that you were able to join us today to be in conversation with Dr. Marie Bea. She's going to help us think about sense of place and ways of knowing. Uh, we invited Dr. Vea to share her thoughts on doing broadly uh, participatory inquiry in the academy. So inquiry in place with communities, inquiry positioned within and toward community values and needs, and inquiry that embodies and embraces a mutualistic pulse toward social and environmental justice. We're excited to learn from Dr. Bea about her dissertation work that in her words, strove to stand strength to strength with beloved community. Before we turn this over to the fabulous Dr. Bea, we wanna sing her praises a little bit and tell you about her professional background. So Dr. Bea serves at a, as Assistant Dean for Student Services and Staff Development in the Rubenstein School of Environmental and Environment and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. She can tell us what the temperature is like in Vermont right now. Um, Dr. Bea is also co-director and faculty in the Leadership uh, for Sustainability Graduate Program at the, also at the University of Vermont. Um, she, there she works with staff and faculty and students toward building a community where all beings may thrive. And that, that all beings, I think, is important and will come out in her talk. Uh, her interests include exploring radically inclusive education and multiple ways of knowing. She believes there is no more compelling time than right now to ask, how do I meet this moment with courage, vulnerability, and creativity? Among her many other accomplishments, Dr. Vea was recently awarded the 2021 Outstanding Dissertation Award from the American Educational Research Association's Qualitative Research Special Interest Group. Um, it's just an honor to have her here with us. Um, just uh, to preface before we turn it over to Dr. Vea, um, as she gets started, please do use the Q&A, the chat and the chat space to bring your thoughts and your questions forward. Um, I know that some parts of this webinar are going to be interactive and intentionally interactive. So we hope that you really feel welcome and inspired to share. This is not going to be one of those webinars where we predominantly sit back and just listen and then ask questions at the end. We will, but there will be some opportunities um, just to share thoughts maybe in the chat a little bit. Um, we also invite you to consider leaving your cameras on during the talk to foster a sense of community, um, given that's so important to all of us here and one of the reasons we've asked Dr. Vea to speak with us. Um, the last 15 minutes or so of our time are going to be a dedicated opportunity for you to raise questions and to dialogue further with Dr. Vea. So we'll keep our eyes on the chat um, and um, raise some of those questions later as they come up. So without further ado, welcome, Dr. Vea. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Rachel. It's been really great to talk with you about what today might look like. And I'm really pleased. Welcome to all of the guests here and, and visitors. And I, I love more intimate conversations. I think we get farther that way. Um, so I'm glad to build the relationship and hope we can continue the relationship. Um, I had heard just before y'all popped on that it's about 87 degrees in Florida. I'm looking out my window, it's overcast and wet, and maybe it's 55 degrees, but um, that's what makes the flowers grow. Um, I'm actually, a, I love the winter. So this shoulder season um, reminds us that, you know, water changes shape and it necessarily does that. So I am going to um, share my screen and share a PowerPoint because images help me think through things. And as Jenny had said at the beginning, there'll be an invitation to share some thoughts. Um, interactivity is really important to me. There is gonna be some talking head stuff at, at, at the middle of it, but I'm hoping that we have a lot of time for conversation. So let me share my screen. You would think after two years of technology that it would become easier, but let me know when you can see. So, all right, haha, <laughs> that went smoothly. Thank you, Zoom gods. So yes, we have um, what we're gonna talk about today, critical reflections on sense of place, the IRB Institutional Research Board, um, the body at most institutions that determines how your research is going to go. And for my part, standing strength to strength with beloved, beloved community and strength to strength is really important to my perspective as a person and, and as a teacher and researcher and hopefully creator is um, standing and recognizing that we are here. It's taken generations for all of us to be here and lots of good fortune and luck and technology to bring us in this space. So acknowledging those strengths is really important. This first image, sense of place. So this area is where I am right now. It is um, the land of the Abenaki, unceded land of the Abenaki to the east, which would be the right on this image, and um, the Iroquois to uh, the yeah, Iroquois to the west on the left. Um, what's important about this image to me is that this is before we drew lines of nation states. What you would see if there were boundaries would be Canada to the north and Vermont to the east with New York um, to, the, uh, to the west. And that body of water in the middle is actually known by the native folks, and I'm hoping it goes to the next slide. There we go. Batobagak, um, the waters between. And I think what's really important about this is that before identity, before claiming land, our ways that we moved in the world were described by our essence. So this water, otherwise known as Lake Champlain for the person, the conqueror, the colonizer that discovered it, quote unquote, it is known as the waters between. I am in the star. So somewhere in that vicinity, that's where I am. That's my physical sense of place. So that's my invitation to you in the next moment to, to think, to acknowledge where your butt is right now. What you're looking at. If you have a window, look out the window. If you know where East is, identify that because I'm going to invite you um, to share with me a grounding exercise that I do with my students. But on the next slide, to go over the flow for our conversation, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a sense of place and go through um, an invitation, a prayer, actually, about where we are literally and figuratively in place. And then we'll go to some meat of it, um, what at least part of my experience was in working with um, qualitative research in the way that I wanted to. And one of the gatekeeping functions of the university is the Institutional Review Board or, or IRB. So I'll share some examples and thoughts on that. And then the strength to strength piece is, is a practice that has been in play for years. And 
I'm two years out from defending my dissertation and there are still ripples and it's a wonderful thing. So wanting to share what those ripples are right now. Um, so the image on the left, I just wanted to call out one of my co-researchers from that dissertation work named um, Floor um, had used this image of the river as their sense of place in the world, um, constantly moving, constantly changing. So this image, the other day I had this as a background and one of my meeting, somebody in the meeting and said, those are lovely lights. And it's actually um, a spider web early in the morning with the dew hanging from it. And luckily I ran, I was running on my dirt road and I ran back to the house and this was before cell phones and I got my little camera my, uh, and took a picture of this. And what I really loved about this was if you notice the little droplets um, come together at the intersection points and actually have bigger droplets. And that's such a wonderful metaphor for how we're connected. We have our individuality, but collectively at our intersection points, there's something else. And these are hanging, suspended in air. Um, this is also facing east. So my invitation to you is as I invoke the different directions, I invite you to join me in invoking the directions wherever you are right now and turn to the different directions as I invite you to do that and to listen. I'm assuming or hoping that y'all have some experience with um, participant observation. So you are observing yourself in this space. What do you see? What do you hear? What's coming up for you? As I invite you to recognize, to acknowledge um, our sense of place here. So. Facing east, I acknowledge the energies of the rising sun, of the wind and the air, of air that blows through um, our lungs, the air that creates vibration, vibration that creates voice. So to the east, thank you for joining us today. We turn to the south the sight of fire and growth, the seed beneath the soil breaking through the ground of the roots bending down, growing down to really hold up what it is that's going to be meeting the sun. So thank you, energies of the South. To the energies of the West, to waters, to shape-shifting, to transformation, to the setting sun and to rest, we thank you for being with us today, energies of the West. And then we turn to the North, the energies of stone, of the first storytellers, of our ancestors, of darkness and deep creativity. We thank you, energies of the North. And then we also call in the energies of the sky and the energies of Mother Earth and the energies that are within and without all the beings that bring us here today. Our gratefulness to all of you. So that is what helps me ground anytime I need a little bit of grounding. And when I invite you, here's the participatory part of it. If there was anything that came up for you, I invite you to put it in the chat. Um, whether it's you want to name the place that you're at, if you want to name what you saw, what you heard, what came up for you, what was the meta reaction, what came up for you to start off this seminar with a sense of place and a prayer. So thank you for sharing if you choose to do that. Um, also, in terms of sense of place, there's positionality that we talk about in our writing, especially as, as it was trained in me as, um, as a doctoral student, the positionality and understanding where we are in relation to the stories that we're going to be asking for and the stories that we tell. And these are four um, headings, themes that I really wanted to drive home in my dissertation and even now is understanding one, that my awareness comes from a colonized place. My ancestors are from the Philippines, colonized by the Spanish for 500 years. And then I came to the United States when I was a child with my family. 
and became in many ways a settler to this land and also a colonizer in the ways that I and my family were acculturated, assimilated into American society, into capitalism and into education. So I am still a product of that education. Um, the telling and retelling of stories that I, I, I think what I've found really interesting in talking with graduate students who are um, seeking to tell stories is that you can't capture a story. It changes as soon as you um, try to set it to memory or set it to paper or set it to the, to the telling. So there is a dynamism in our storytelling that I find really exciting. And poetic transcription and poetry for me captures that kind of dynamism and living um, that stories have. Incommensurate ecotones. If you're familiar with Eve Tuck from, I think she's still at Pace University, who talks about the incommensurability of our experiences, particularly with regard to indigenous ways of knowing um, or, or racial um, relations, is that it's nice to come together to find common ground. It's not possible. But maybe if we stand shoulder to shoulder and in that space between us, we find some way that spark where our differences might actually create the other thing or create the new thing, that is what we might be striving for in our scholarship um, and in our problem solving. I put that in, quote, in quotes. So the incommensurability of how, where we stand in relation to each other is actually exciting. And then finally, disrupting academia as usual. I talk, and I'm sure you all talk, with hundreds and hundreds of students as they come in, really excited to be part of a learning community. And it's ingrained in them how they ought to behave. Um, and oftentimes there is a code swishing that needs to happen, a cultural assimilation that needs to happen. And what I, had in, I invited in my work and as I continue to work with students is to let's push on that a little bit and disrupt academia as usual. That image is when we went to um, lockdown and we were all doing work from our bedrooms, from our kitchens, from our back decks. So we know now that we can do things differently. And I also wanted to call out that my work is specifically with Black, Indigenous, and people of color and how BIPOC folks, if I make a generalization, um, necessarily move through the usual in unusual ways. And that oftentimes the systems that we inhabit do not see us fully, that they see us as particular identities and, and demographics. And that's what we're trying to disrupt. And the bottom, um, Jacobs is the, um, oh my gosh, I'm not going to remember the name of the title, but uh, writes examples of alternative dissertations. And it was so freeing to see that there are many ways of telling a story and it is knowledge. So I wanted to go call out to Jacobs. So that's my sense of place in figurative ways. And there's a grounding to it. And at the same time, there's a movement to um, where we might um, see from a different perspective what's happening. And as I was moving through the doctoral program and as I advise uh, doctoral students now, um, especially if they're working with populations with people, they're having to go through this IRB process. And thankfully, I should say in the College of Education where I did my doc work, there was a class at the end of the coursework for uh, doctoral students called dissertation writing. And it was designed as a lab to have doc students come together and actually write with each other. And the professor of the year that I took it, 2019, who Kelly Clark Keith, also my advisor, invited different experts from across campus to talk with us. One of them was the director of the grad college to tell us, inform us how to design our, uh, format our manuscript. And the other group that she invited were people from the IRB to actually tell us what's going on with IRB. And it wasn't just an information sharing, it was to build relationship. 
so that Ted Marcy, the person who would be reviewing my IRB application, actually knew who I was and could, could picture my face as I was going through the process. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And before I tell you what happened with the IRB, I just need to set a little bit of context. So the thrust of most of my dissertation is that there is a problem with Western research. Um, it does three things, it does many things, but in, in my work, um, it predominantly comes from, from a perspective that reduces the whole to its parts. That's why we have hundreds of majors uh, and we're still trying to figure out what integration might look like. Um, it emphasizes researcher objectivity. How often do we hear that there is a certain stance that a researcher must take when they are researching, observing something? We make an assumption that that is um, objective. And it also is hierarchical, depending on your voice, your privilege, where you come from, your credentials, we do believe that there are certain truths that are more valid than others. Um, so that is the problem with research. All of that is known in a couple of different circles as epistemic injustice, academic imperialism, and neocolonialism. So with that, my stance as a researcher, as a qualitative researcher is definitely participatory, loving its community. And I prefer the word co-researchers to subjects, to participants, to informants. Um, my stance is that it's strengths-based, that oftentimes, especially when we work with BIPOC communities, we're often asking the question, what's wrong with them? Why don't they dot, dot, dot? Um, instead of Louis Mall, who does Funds of Knowledge, asked another question, what do they bring? What are the strengths that they bring into the classroom that should be, needs to be acknowledged by teachers? It's narrative inquiry, it's stories. And Clendenin, I love, says that um, over the course of your research, you, you likely will fall in love with the people you're researching with, that if you don't come out with more questions and you might be doing it wrong. And my work is also informed by indigenous methods. I am so fortunate to have elders in my life that have been so patient with me in asking questions and um, helping me um, decolonize some of my thinking. And central to this work was relationality, how we relate to each other, how we hold each other accountable, and how do we tell stories um, connect to each other in ways that are transformative. Um, it's also arts-based, a lot of images and a lot of poetry. And I thank Corrine Glesney for that. So this is my stance going into IRB. And as you know, IRB comes out of a very medical model, a very safety, do no harm, not, no liability kind of model. So there are a couple of things that I'm going to focus on. There were a lot. This, my, my process before actually embarking on the research for my dissertation, the IRB took about four months. It took from January to May, February to May. Lots of memos, lots of going back on, on emails. And I'm just gonna focus on two things. Uh, because I was working with alumni from the Rubenstein School, 18 people I was going to, 18 alumni that I was going to invite. And these were alumni of color that I had been in relationship with as undergraduate students and kept in touch with over the course of, since 2008. Phone calls, visits to their homes. Um, we would, they would send me emails to let me know how things were going. So I knew their lives and they knew mine. And because these were going to be the participants in this study, the IRB was really concerned with the risk of distress and really wanted for me to include resources, you know, psychiatrists. And, and that landed on me so badly. I went to my advisors and said, this is such a medical model where you're pathologizing any kind of discomfort in the process. So where is the relationality? Where is the... Um, the hope that we can in community address feelings of marginalization that will come up 
feelings of um, displacement, because that comes up for BIPOC folks, um, feelings of invisibility and silence and oppression. I do not want to farm that out to an expert. Um, so all of this stuff, my committee comes back, Marie, <laughs> we know that and we stand with you. And I remember I was looking at my emails last night. Um, one of my committee members had said that the IRB's job is to protect because that is how they came into being. And being relational and participatory are two amorphous terms for a, an organization that needs to follow very particular guidelines. Your goal is to get, to the, get the IRB approval. That's your number one goal. So what I did upon advisement was to let the IRB know, and then also in my consent forms going out to, um, in my invitations to, to co-researchers, is that daily interaction, that their participation may result in some feelings of um, distress, some emotional reaction. We can expect some emotional reaction that my first response would be to check in with them. And that if needed, we can go to other resources. But really what I, want, what I wanted to, uh, the message I wanted to send was that um, we were there as a community, that there would be community agreements. And I made a point of saying that to the IRB, that we will move through this holding each other because that is what relationality is about. Um, over the course of the IRB going back and forth, I shared citation after citation after resource after author about how communities come together to support each other, that we didn't need psychiatrists for this. But I understood why the IRB wanted to have that kind of protection. So that passed muster after several memos back and forth. The other, um, the other issue that uh, became a really interesting touch point for myself, my committee, and other folks that I've worked with that have read my work is the progression from subjects to participants to co-researchers. Um, when I first submitted my IRB, I framed it that we would be talking together um, as a community about questions of sense of place and ways of knowing. And this is what had come back, that I could not refer to this community as co-researchers. They were not trained. They are not personnel. They needed to um, submit credentials in order to be called co-researchers. And to me, that just sounded like hierarchy and objectivity and extraction again. And where was the accountability within our, our group? Um, the committee came back. Here's your opportunity to educate the IRB, Marie. And I did cite numerous resources and to speak the language of the IRB and to an, invite more conversation with Ted Marcy that I mentioned earlier. So there were a couple of conversations with Ted Marcy and a couple of phone calls with other staff at the IRB. And what we landed on um, was to use the language of the IRB, participants as co-researchers, and using the word co-researcher in tandem with participants and understanding or conveying that the research is participatory, it is happening together because we want to uplift the knowledge that these co-researchers have, these beloveds have, and that not doing that was actually um, uh, sustaining a, a dominant view of, of research and how knowledge um, is, is created. So it passed, this was my approval. It passed on, I got my approval on May 28th. And I, I think as I reflect that it was the several back and forth with IRB, um, several resources that I could point them to and the wordsmithing of my committee, as well as my committee also talking with the IRB about um, the importance of this research. 
So those are just two things. I, I can talk about three or more other issues with the IRB, but just, to, just wanted to, to focus on this and some of the takeaways that I wanted to share um, that I think are part of the larger research endeavor is that um, at least with the IRB, we, we were always on the same page, do no harm, but we were coming at it from very different perspectives and worldviews. And um, having that understanding that incommensurate piece of it means that we could meet together to talk about we're doing, we're, we're trying to achieve, achieve the same thing. Developing relationship with the IRB staff, using the process as an education of the IRB. So I, I don't know what it's like in, at, in other institutions. I know that at the University of Vermont, there has been a number of researchers before me that have set a path to, the, to, conver to have conversations with the IRB. It still took me time to disavow the IRB of some, some of those kind of notions. Um, and then also speaking the IRB language. So having your foot in both camps, and it does help to have people understand how that works and to find the words in, in the document. So once we finally got the, <laughs> the, the research going, it was lovely. We had, 10 co-researchers, as I said, people that were so important to me that I can say I loved them and they loved the connection with each other. And in my research, I was looking for different ways of knowing. And this is one way of knowing, standing strength to strength with not just the human co-researchers, but also the more than human co-researchers. That was the thing that let, was unsaid in the IRB process is that an indigenous, and I, I'm always careful using the word indigenous because I don't want to essentialize millions of people and hundreds of populations across the word, world, what, might, what that might mean. But there is a feeling at least in the communities that I am a part of that all things have life, that all things, are alive. And if that is true, and I, I feel that to be true, then the more than human world were as much co-researching in our work than the humans were. And that was all beloved community. So when the data came back and I had reams, hours of uh, recordings and written material and images, I ran it through NVivo you know, typed it all up and I got all the bars and I got all the graphs and I got all the 326 of this and 426 of that. And then I realized that that was literally breaking up the stories, literally breaking up the experiences of these co-researchers. And um, I went to my advisor and said, this doesn't feel good. And she had said, well, how about living close to the data? You don't have to do more. Um, build your relationship. You know this. So I remember feeling, oh my God, I am trying to do Western work, pushing the boundaries of research, but I'm still stuck in the, but I got to run this through an in vivo database. So I went back and I went to an extra intellectual place and I downloaded all of those, all those recordings onto my phone. And I listened to those recordings on every drive. I listened to, to, listened to them while I was cooking. I listened to them by the, bi by the bonfire. Um, and I listened for the life in that data. I listened to the messages that were inherent in the, the tone of voice, in the pauses, in the laughter, in the tension, and really got to see that the life of that data having its own spirit, frankly, that lent itself to our experience. And out of that, and I won't go into any detail, the ways of knowing that came out in terms of themes were self-making, strength to strength. Um, and what was the final one? I can't see it here. <laughs> you can read that there. Um, and what I wanted to say about strength to strength is that even now I'm in touch with co-researchers and this person, Jen, who's back you see, who's with their beloved Milo. Jen just let me know in a text yesterday 
Maria got into grad school. She got into an MSW. She was accepted at three of her three, three, three for three at her institutions, Hunter College, um, New Jersey, whatever that university was, and, and Columbia University. Columbia University was her top choice. She's now waiting on the scholarship. Um, and I share that because in my communication with these co-researchers, there have been ripples of our time where they have said that having language around what our strengths are and also acknowledging where we've been colonized, where we have been compelled to hide our light instead of shine our light, sharing that in community was the healing that they needed in order to move forward in their other spaces. And other folks have gone into other spaces. They've gone to graduate school. They've gone into their communities. They're working with other populations and have taken that kind of strength along with them. And I think that is the powerful stuff that research can do. Um, and a quote from Jen, how she regarded her beloved Milo as a mentor and beloved that helped her um, live unapologetic, unapologetically. Blah. So just a couple of things as, as I, I close here is that I'm an avid cross-country skier. I don't know that you get any snow in, in Florida, but um, there is um, an intention that when I bring people out, people of color to uh, ski, and I do this on weekends in the wintertime, that we're storming white spaces literally storming white spaces. And I love that there are people of color here um, in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, which is predominantly white in a sport that is predominantly white. Because I think that kind of taking up space is social justice embodied. And there are things yet to think about that I invite you to think about and I hope maybe will be part of our conversation in a moment is that research itself, need, itself needs to change, that the real science is inaccessible. We have to pay for it. It's in peer-reviewed articles. Who in the general public are going to read peer-reviewed articles? And that Western science elitism is working against itself. When you hear of folks saying, I don't trust those scientists. I don't trust the science. It's because we haven't made it accessible. It's the problem with the environment, environmentalism also. Environmentalism is elitist. Um, so we're having a hard time bringing people along. We live with terrible, terrible situations, police brutality, murder of black lives, indigenous lives, trans lives, climate collapse. And we have to ask ourselves, are we protecting and sustaining the dominant institutions and in ways of knowing that God is here? And how will, will white supremacy concede? And I am all for radical inclusion, radical spaciousness, radical consciousness, radical creativity, letting go of product, radical rest, radical care, and radical joy. All of that is elegant subversion. Having a relationship with the IRB is itself elegant subversion. Saying love in many academic spaces is elegant subversion. So I say to you that there are many ways of knowing, that they're all valid, that we are all learning, teaching, researching, and creating. That there are many ways to tell our stories and we must tell our stories in many ways. And I thank you for your time. Salamat po, which is Tagalog for thank you. And this final photo of one of my beloved co-researchers, Kunal, in that strong stance, hands on hips, looking out across the land is inspiring to me. So thank you again for inviting me. And I look forward to conversation here and in the days forward. Thank you. I'm gonna stop my share so I can see all of you. Hi, y'all. <laughs> all right, let's invite everyone to respond to Marie and raise some questions. 
Thank you, uh, Marie. My name is Dana Roberts, and I work with Rachel uh, at the Action Centre. I'm a post, uh, or sorry, a, a doctoral candidate postdoc, hope, hope to be someday. Um, so uh, this is more of a comment. Um, I'm, in a, I'm in a bit of a, a space um, called Dissertation Hell. Um, and uh, uh, Rachel and I have had really great heart to heart discussions about that because she's now out of dissertation hell. <laughs> um, but I thought your almost last, last point about elegant subversion is so profound. Um, uh, my dissertation is starting to go towards counter narrative and building it through participatory action research. So this is so timely, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yes, um, as a white person, um, where I'm working now is working from kind of an excuse making of white fragility from D'Angelo. I don't know if you've uh, heard about that, but uh, towards white humility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I, I was born 40 miles north of where you are in Montreal, um, and uh, uh, Canada has its own really ugly uh, colonial, uh, De Champlain is, uh, is a uh, hero in mm -hmm. Canada, uh, very much so, uh, and uh, the treatment of First Nations uh, people, uh, people of color, um, uh, treating people as things was was very much part of Canada making Canada making in terms of its modern uh, nation statehood. So so you know humility it's beyond that. Like uh, we've got work to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm not quite sure where I was going with this other than bravo. Um, uh, uh, the, other, the other thing that I, I really like, going right back to the very far part, uh, uh, front part of, of your presentation of connecting us to the ground, Mother Earth um, and the directions. Um, there is so much, if you go back into the mists of time, uh, even current nation states, the founding of some of their philosophical stance, like Taoism, is, is, is shamanistic in its approach to how the universe works. Mm -hmm. So as Westerners, and whether we're Westerners or Western educated, we are decapitated from that. Mm -hmm. That's just a general comment. And that is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, and really what my work is, is about getting my head back into my heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And dissertation, yeah. dissertation help. <laughs> all, all of that resonates. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll say for, for Canada, when I started looking at um, the literature of, on, on Indigenous education and in, in indigeneity in education, especially in higher education, there was far more literature going on in Canada than there is in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so, and OECI in Toronto actually is the repository for a lot of that. And okay. um, Lake Lakeside University or Lakeland University on the, the West. Lakehead. Or is it Lakehead? Lakehead? Right, yes, I Lakehead. Lakehead. Um, yeah. Yeah. Has a, a number of authors that- Yeah, they're great. Are, but, um, but it makes me wonder about what it is, um, what's the difference between Canada and at, at least some authors feeling like they can ask those questions and put out those papers and less so here in the United States. Um, I have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. About 20 years ago, there was a Supreme Canadian Supreme Court ruling around Indigenous lands. Mm -hmm. And the justices basically said, we're here, all of us together. We have to learn and get along. Mm -hmm. And the ruling yeah. came. The ruling came down in favor of indigenous people, mm -hmm. and that then broke free towards. Uh... Was there a pause? I think we oh, might have oh. lost Dana. Oh, okay. <laughs> And I'll, I, you know, I also, uh, there was one thing about the elegance of version. I don't, I'm sorry, Dana, you had frozen. So I wasn't, uh, yeah. we weren't sure. Oh, there we go. Um, 
But thank you for that. And, and I think that is important that our um, legal institutions are, will not recognize that and will not, that's what, that was my question, will white supremacy concede? Um, they won't even acknowledge, <laughs> let alone concede. Um, but when I, you know, the elegant subversion, when I've used that, I, I don't mean that as doing things on the backside or doing things. I think there's a transparency that needs to happen. That's the elegance of it. And for example, um, my work with the, the um, Masters for Leader, the Leadership for Sustainability program, um, there's a system about paying our affiliates who deliver. We have an affiliate community of tribal members that um, offer um, modules in our graduate level courses. And if they were waiting to get paid through the university, they would wait for months, um, literally months. So um, my co-director built, created another nonprofit to be the fiduciary manager for a lot of the funds so that our affiliates could get paid right there and then. So we were transparent about that with our business office. This is what we're doing. And this is how we are um, subverting the system at the university. So that's an example of um, elegant subversion. Um, and then also like putting love in your syllabi or talking to students about prayer. Um, I say that intentionally using the word sacred. That's elegant subversion too. And I just want to say thank you for your, your, your comments in the chat. I love hearing about um, what, what it was like to turn to the directions and get a sense of that. Marie, can I ask you to speak um, maybe with a little bit more detail or making connections to methodologists? Um, it's a big move to go from coding data to letting go of all of that and picking up a methodology of listening. Um, and I, I wish I could just bottle that and give it out in my qualitative classes mm -hmm. um, to say, this is, this is a thing. Um, yeah. that you can do. Can you, so can you talk more about that? Yeah. Um, it took, I, I should say, so I collected everything over two and a half months um, in the summer of 2019. So by everything, I mean um, at least 12 hours of video, um, at least several more hours of audio, and then writing. I had a blog up with my co-researchers so that we could record our photos and then the reflections could also be in writing. So I, I transcribed all of that. And then I did plug all of that into NVivo and that itself, just the practice of that is research. So, so I didn't, I, I don't think that I went from um, like one lane and then switch lanes entirely. I think that was a good initial step but then it was very different to, I already had all of that in my head. I actually had the felt experience of typing in their words. Um, and I did have in my head, oh, this theme came up in those bars on NVivo. So I could listen for it when it happened, but it added more dimension to actually hear the, the interviews or not the interviews, the recordings in chronological order. I could actually start to hear um, when a co-researcher was feeling more comfortable in the conversations. I could hear when or see visually when people were pulling back or you know moving forward into a conversation, even though all of this happened online in Zoom. So it did take more time. I remember sitting down with my advisor who fully supported that I was doing that. I was done with my in vivo um, in what this November of that fall. Um, and took a whole other several months, three more months to just to live with it. Um, and, and honestly, doing that helped the writing to flow and putting those into poetic transcription um, helped the writing to flow. So because I found my thing, I found, I found the way that I, how I wanted to communicate. Um, yeah, I can't communicate in NVivo, uh, but I can communicate through story and poetry. So it takes more time and more work. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, I think Jenny, you and I talked about this once before, is that for some graduate students, they have a timeline and they also have to do um, 
several other, we, we load all kinds of responsibilities on graduate students. I had the, the, the privilege of um, integrating my graduate work with my full-time job in an environment of natural, res and natural resources. So I made a point of my work informing, my day-to-day -day work informing my research and vice versa. Thank you so much for this um, conversation. There were a couple of things that like, I would love to hear you talk a little more about, which is these two areas that you spoke about today are that, that I was really drawn to, I guess, um, like doing work um, to further um, loving and strength to strength orientations to environmental concerns and like directly addressing um, things like climate collapse and um, attuning to place as part of that. Um, and then confronting um, these, these, these challenges in qualitative inquiry. And they both are so rife with, as you pointed out, white supremacy. And I guess I'm wondering, um, along with elegant subversion, how do you navigate those tensions um, in communicating to folks where, um, where there aren't those formal structures like the IRB, like, because mm -hmm. there's this, like, when there are those, like, and the, and the formality of, um, of like paying your, your, your folks, like those are such formalized structures that I think prompt like, um, like clarity sometimes and like really hard work, but like, okay, I'm going to have this conversation back and forth because they have set it up this way and I have to like follow it. I guess I'm wondering like in those softer spaces where, um, that it, it rears its ugly head and maybe, or maybe I'm, I guess I want to know how to attune to it outside of those formal spaces to what you were talking about and what, what work, what that work looks like as well. Um, I don't know if that made sense, but that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, the attunement. I'm going to glom on to, to that word. Um, it, you know, it takes time and, re and relationship to have our radar on. And so I, 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 I've been teaching, I've been, I don't any longer, I've been teaching an undergraduate course in race and culture and natural resources for 10 years. So, so they're at this place of awareness, not even attunement, but you know, what, what is systemic oppression? What is racism? You know, what is privilege and, and whiteness? Um, and, and doing that with, with undergrads, um, also having those, having that awareness um, in with with colleagues in meetings at the grocery store, you know, I, you know, all of those. There's a, there is a certain there's a sensitivity that I think people who have have had to shape shift that way um, they know, and and I I if to use some of the language of ecology is that when we have when we when I when I wanted to start birding when I wanted to learn how to identify more birds. Um, my friends would say, don't try to learn all the birds, learn one or two birds really, really well so that you can recognize them. You recognize their patterns, you recognize their colorization, you recognize their calls. Um, you know, what context, what, what they look like and sound like in September versus April. Um, and then as you build that expertise, you'll sensitize yourself, build relationship with more birds and more species. It takes that much time. And when you, when you have that sensitivity or that awareness, then you can see it as white folks, you can see that in all of your interactions, the light is on and you can't turn it off. So the softness, I think when I, you know, when I work with graduate students, when that awareness is on, they go for it. They go, oh my God, I'm calling you out. And then the, the nuance of it comes with, um, with time. And what does it mean to actually be in relationship, even in the tension? So I don't know if that answers your question, Alex. There is, there's no bullet. <laughs> there's no, uh, there's no twelve step. Um, 
as a recent as a as a recent birder here in Florida, the, that metaphor was really lovely and very I, I, I resonated for me. So, um, yeah, I, and thank I you. I think also there's um, and I'm sure this isn't new to any of you, but the spirit of inquiry. It's like, what did you mean by that story? Or you know, that's landing in a way that I, I can we pause? I can't hear you now because I'm back at that comment. Can we revisit that comment? Something happened. Um, so I, I paused the moment to see if anybody else, did anybody else hear that? Um, so that's how I kind of call out and call in. What, what's el what else is on your hearts? I don't know if this is a question, Marie, either, um, but I'm I'm thinking about uh, the the ways that I think qualitative researchers work so hard to legitimize their work. Like we feel like we have to constantly prove that it is research or that it is scientific or that it is meeting all of these really positivist measures of quality and goodness and. Um, I love the story of like, I did the en vivo thing. And then I was like, no. <laughs> and I guess I'm, I'm wondering if, if you feel like that, like the, some of that um, work in en vivo or some of the, the coding stuff there, like, do you see that as really just an attempt to legitimize qualitative work by a quantitative measurement or by some mm -hmm. quantitative measurement of what good research is defined to be? Or, and is then the work really to like define quality, qualitative research by different measures entirely? Because it seems to me too, that that's really the tension with the IRB is that they really prioritize and value quantitative work. And so qualitative researchers try to push their work into that space, but it never quite fits. So then we do all this mm -hmm. other stuff to say like, it is real research and it is science and it is a finding. And just because it's not replicable doesn't mean it isn't valuable. And mm -hmm. I, I just, it's my takeaway from your talk today is like, we can define the value of this work by a totally different measure than the space that quantitative research research is living in. So mm -hmm. I, again, I don't know what the question is or that's what I'm thinking about. Um, and I don't know if you want to say more like, yes, let us never, let us free ourselves from in vivo forever. <laughs> but I'm thinking about like that as a measure of goodness or value. Right. You know, thank you for that. There, there's a couple of, a couple of thoughts and I, I know we're at time soon, but um, so my closest mentors are qualitative researchers, you know, no surprise there. So one is a digital storyteller and the other person uses painting um, as, as, as data. Um, and, and they were my co-conspirators in really trying to get IRB to approve, not convince them, you know, educate them a little bit, just getting them to approve. So there are the institutions and, and, and the qualitative pieces, you know, I think I appreciated En Vivo just as kind of a first kind of, am I on a track? Um, it's a tool. And I have, uh, I've made a new friend actually, who is um, a queer researcher, who is a policy wonk and is a, is a quantitative researcher. And he and I had a conversation recently that I'm a qualitative person. He's a quantitative person. He feels like telling stories about queer people ought to be qualitative, but he's comfortable in the quantitative camp and moving policy, they need numbers. So in his grant writing, he partners with qualitative researchers. But in our, my conversation with him, like I, I know, it's like you, we hear all the stories of what's going on in the queer community that doesn't get, there's no recognition of that, regardless of what the research is, regardless of what the papers are. Policy needs numbers. So to answer your question, there, there is, there's partnership there that we can leverage. Um, and it can't be an either or, it has to be um, um, this, you know, and this and. Yeah, it makes me, I know we're over time, so I promise Jenny, I won't say anything long, but it makes me think too about the necessity of numbers in the K-12 spaces also. They are just so dedicated to what that quantitative research is showing um, 
that we, yeah, we have to find spaces where we can collaborate and, and work in the in-between spaces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I love, love that. Thank you so much, Marie. And it's just a, a pleasure to learn from you. Um, so thank you for sharing your research and your experiences and, um, and your ideas for moving forward. Um, everybody who's here, um, if you would like to be in touch with Dr. Vea, she's very generously provided her email. Um, it is Marie, M-A-R-I-E dot Vea, V-E-A at uvm.edu. And we'll send that out. Um, we always send out a follow-up with the recording um, of the uh, of the podcast or podcast webinar. Um, <laughs> so if, if you miss it here in the chat, uh, you'll have it there. And thank you again to the David C. Anshin Center and the Graduate Student Council and all of our colleagues in the QUAG um, for helping this event to take place. So I hope everyone was inspired by the conversation that Dr. Vea began here with us today, and I hope that it will continue. I know it will continue at USF and beyond. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take good care. Thank you.